All players, low down, active, bullseye, one, three, two, seven. Put tactical. Hey everybody, welcome to the show where you make sense of defense in a dribble way. Today we have a very special guest and a very special episode with Norm Augustine. He spent four decades in the defense industry, culminating as the first CEO of Lockheed Martin. He was the undersecretary of the army in the 70s. He lived through the defense industry's heyday in the 80s, and he witnessed and orchestrated the consolidation of the entire industry in the 90s. And he was present at the Last Supper, and he's got quite a story to tell. And after all that, he decided to go help the CIA with technology scouting and investments. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. And don't forget to leave us a rating and a review on your content platform of choice. Norm Augustine, welcome. You were a very hard man to get a hold of, and I didn't make it any easier by putting you through that technological gymnastics that we just had to go through. So <laughs> thank you so much for your time and your patience. Mike, it's my pleasure, but uh, I think I lost all my credibility as a technical person. Uh, I didn't seem to be able to make the transmission work. What's amazing is that turning it off and turning it back on was the solution, right? It's like the classic IT fix. I am pretty sure there's one of your 52 laws or something. One of them fits into that bin. Uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to look at it as we get as we get into discussions. I have them up on another monitor here. <laughs> when uh, when I reached out to you, thanks for just not deleting my email. We we actually had a talk just to convince you to have a talk because you're like, no one <laughs> wants to talk to me. Like, well, I have nothing to add here. Like, just leave me alone. <laughs> well, I'm glad we made connection. And I look forward to visiting. Norm, you have four decades in the defense industry and then another two decades after you left Lockheed Martin, and we'll go through your uh, we'll go through your your story arc uh, in a, in just a minute. But you're you're still going strong, so congratulations on that. You've had multiple successful careers now. Well, it uh, one thing leads to another, and uh, none of it was planned. It all just sort of happened. I did in the course of my career worked uh, some in government, some in industry, and some in academia. And, some in charitable things. So I had a quite a variety of things to do. You say it like so humbling, but so four decades into the defense industry, you were the CEO of Lockheed Martin. You've, uh, let's see, I think you have something like 30 plus honorary degrees, dozens of national accolades. You've been on the boards of several um, companies, foundations, uh, you were a, a guest lecturer at Princeton. I think at one point you ran the Boy Scouts of America. I mean, on and on and on. The Department of Defense's highest civilian decoration. Uh, you've won it five times. Yeah, you're uh, you're being very, very humble, Norm. This is the time where you get to tell us about yourself, though. So you can't be humble. So let's start in, in the beginning. And you actually worked for, even though you ended up at Lockheed Martin, you started at what would eventually be their competitor, which is a McDonnell Douglas, right? In the 50s? Yeah, I did. Uh, actually, when I was in college, I uh, worked uh, d during a summer at Boeing. And uh, then when I uh, got out of college, out of graduate school, I uh, took a job. It was actually Douglas in those days. It was before it was McDonnell Douglas. And uh, uh, Douglas was in my view at that time, kind of the dominant company in the aerospace industry. And uh, I applied to work in their aeronautics group because uh, I had done my master's thesis on vertical takeoff aircraft. And uh, due to a mix up in the uh, uh, human resources group at Douglas, I was given a job in the, the missiles and space group, which sort of changed my career. And uh, I worked at Santa Monica on a variety of projects for Douglas, and uh, those were glory days in the industry. Uh, commercial jets were just coming out rather broadly, and uh, the space program was uh, had started uh, a year earlier. As a matter of fact, the week I 
began graduate school in uh, aeronautical engineering uh, at Sputnik went up. And so uh, that gave me an opportunity to uh, work in a brand new world that uh, I knew as much about as anybody else because nobody knew anything. And so everybody was on an equal footing. It was, it was a great time. I got to do a little teeny bit on the Apollo program. That's not modesty. It's just fact. But uh, later I got to know all the astronauts and became friends with Neil and Buzz and Mike and so on. And it, it was an exciting time. The fact that you just call them Neil, Buzz, and Mike is, uh, (laughs) that's amazing. So you worked in the defense for about 20 years and then somehow you ended up, and I don't know how as a space and missiles guy, but you ended up as an undersecretary of the army. How how did that happen? (laughs) Yeah, that's a funny story. Uh, I got a phone call one day asking if I would, consider being an assistant secretary for research and development of the Air Force. And uh, I said that uh, there was really no way I could do that because I had just was in a job. I was working hard. And uh, they said, well, will you come back and at least talk about it? So I said, sure. And so I went back to the Pentagon and uh, Jim Schlesinger had just become secretary of defense. I didn't know Jim at the time. But uh, in the process of talking to me about taking the Air Force job, uh, which seemed to make sense for an aeronautical engineer, they, Jim wanted to talk to me. So I went down to his office. and uh, Jim was a person of few words. Uh, he said, Norm, how would you uh, rank the three services in terms of the quality of their research and development? And I said, well, the Navy would be first and the Air Force just a little bit behind them and the Army way behind them. And he looked at me, he says, do I have the job for you? And uh, I wound up uh, in tanks and uh, <laughs> air defense missiles and so on. And uh, I had intended to go back to the Pentagon at all. But uh, I certainly had it <laughs> expected to be working with the Army. And uh, over the years, I became thrilled to do that. I'm awfully proud of what the Army does and the people in the Army. And so it it worked out awfully well, at least from my perspective. Is that your connection of how you became the, uh, at one point you were, you were the president and chairman of the association of the United States army. I was, when I left the army, I, I had served as assistant secretary R D, under secretary of the army, and then secretary of the army uh, acting for the latter job for, I, I guess, I don't know, four months or something like that. And, uh, when I left that job, I had obviously become closely engaged with the Army, so I had uh, joined the Association of the U.S. Army, and they asked if I would consider chairing it, which I did. And uh, that uh, carried my connection on beyond the years I was actually in the Pentagon. You said you said back to the Pentagon earlier when I was asking about the Undersecretary of the Army. Were you in the Pentagon before that? Yeah, I had two tours, six different jobs. Uh, uh, you don't keep jobs very long in the Pentagon, it seems. But anyway, the the first time I went to the government uh, was when I was at Douglas. And uh, I'm having to dig deeply here. This has been a few years ago. Uh, <laughs> it's okay. Take your time. <laughs> okay, this was 1965. And uh, my brain is 88, so <laughs> this is a different <laughs> Putting that aside, uh, I was at Douglas, and uh, Douglas was having some problems that made some terrible management decisions, some of the worst I've ever seen. And so I was, uh, I got a phone call and said, when I, uh, back to America, I'd just become Secretary of Defense, and they were looking for young, energetic, inexperienced people, and I fit the qualifications, and uh, asked if I'd come back and uh, work on uh, McNamara's staff in the Office of Defense Research and Engineering. And uh, that was a particularly powerful office at that time. And uh, I didn't know much about it. I didn't know anything about it. But anyway, uh, I asked how many people worked there. And I remember whoever I was talking to said, well, I see there's Ron and Charlie and Dan. (laughs) And I thought, gosh, if they can name it by name, it's got to be a small office. And I could tell from the industry that it had a lot of influence. 
And so I went back, talked to him, and decided to take that job. And uh, it was very disruptive because uh, I had a two-year-old and a two-week-old. And uh, But anyway, I, uh, my wife and I, particularly my wife, stepped up to him. We went back to the Pentagon. That was the first tour. I stayed five years, as I say, in a couple of different jobs. And uh, it was a tough time because the Vietnam War was... Uh, really boiling at that time and I started out in strategic systems where Russia was the problem and then I was asked after a year and a half I guess to uh, move over to tactical warfare which dealt with all three services all four services three departments and uh, the uh, issue there was uh, heavily related to Vietnam so that was a challenge and uh, in any event that accounted for five years. Can you remember anything um, reaching way back, like a particular program or something that you, you know, have your thumbprint on that you tried to help advance or shape? I, I sure can because a lot of them are in the newspaper today. Uh, I wrote the uh, approval paper for the Patriot missile uh, for McNamara, which I took up to him and he signed to approve starting the Patriot program, which is, of course, a major interest in uh, Ukraine today. And uh, I wrote the approval paper for the AWACS aircraft. And uh, I don't know, I go down the list. Uh, and then when I moved over to the Army after, well, I'm getting this confused here. I worked for Douglas, then I went to work for the Pentagon for McNamara. And then I left to work for LTV Corporation in Dallas. And uh, they too went out of business. So, uh, which everywhere I went seemed to, <laughs> the companies, I don't know why they totally hired me, I'm but sure. anyway, uh, before they went out of business, uh, that's when I was asked to come back and be Assistant Secretary of the Army for R&D. And uh, so I, my early part of my career was heavily in defense. And uh, as I say, there were challenging times because uh, uh, Russia was uh, a major concern and NATO and so on. And I spent a lot of time working with NATO and spent a very brief time in Vietnam uh, as a civilian. And uh, that was kind of interesting too because they gave me an army uniform. And uh, when I was in, in Vietnam on a special project for uh, Dave Packard, who was Deputy Secretary of Defense. And uh, my uniform had my name on it, but no rank or anything else, no insignia, just my name. And I was very concerned that uh, our own troops would know whether to salute me or shoot me. <laughs> but <laughs> fortunately, they, they kind of put up with it. And so at the end of the five years and the, under McNamara, I wanted to go back to industry. My, my career was always in industry. In those days, if you were asked to serve a government, you didn't say no. It was your duty as a citizen that I was extremely proud to, uh, to have been asked. And uh, as I say, from a personal standpoint, it was terribly inconvenient. And it may sound trite today, but I, I was very proud to be a public servant. I thought to serve the public is about as fine a thing as you could ever do. And uh, at the same time, my interest was not in government. It was in the industry. And each time I had agreed to stay two or three years, I wound up staying, staying five the first time and over four the second time. So I put in over nine years of government. Wow. I did not realize that, uh, that it was that extensive. That's uh that is even make you even more eclectic as an individual <laughs> over the course of your career. Well, I'm an engineer, so don't use words like eclectic, but I, I, I sort of was. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. So when you left the Pentagon, now we're in the in the late seventies. When you left the Pentagon, did you go directly to um, Martin Marietta, or did you do something else? Yeah, Mike, that's right. I uh, left the Pentagon in seventy seven, and then I went to work for Martin Marietta in its headquarters in uh, Washington D.C. And uh, I my position was uh, was it vice president of. Uh, technical operations, which meant manufacturing, research, and development. And I didn't know a lot about manufacturing, so it was a great opportunity to 
take a fresh look at a lot of things. And of course, I, by now, a fair background in research and development. And I worked for Martin Marietta, which uh, was sort of a mid-sized company. I went to work there completely by accident. I had intended to take a job with another company, and uh, which I could talk about if you want to take the time. But uh, in any event, I wound up at Martin Marietta and was very happy there. I was looking at some of the product lines from manufacturing back at that time, and that was a uh, mostly uh, like rocket-based products. Whether it's uh, like the booster for the space shuttle, the big orange um, tank on the old space shuttle, like Martin created that, and then the Titan and Atlas rockets, right? That's true. And uh, there's a funny story about that orange booster for the, the shuttle. It's the was the not only the carried the liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, but it also was the structural backbone for the shuttle stack. When the first 10 articles that we built down at the Mishu plant in near New Orleans, uh, the first 10 we built were white. And uh, we were given a contract uh, somewhere during that period of time to take, uh, gosh, I forgot, I think it was 8,000 pounds out of the weight of that tank. It was a huge tank. Uh, I figured once if you put it on its side, the entire Wright Brothers flight could have taken place inside of it, uh, the famous flight. And anyway, I uh, was involved, obviously, in trying to figure out how to get 8,000 pounds out of the space shuttle because it transferred almost, it translated almost directly into payload. And uh, I wasn't there at the meeting I'm going to describe, but it was described to me by people who were there. There was a meeting in Mishu, and we had gotten... Uh, I think it was 7,200 pounds, and don't hold me to that, uh, 7,200 pounds out of the shuttle and uh, the weight of the fuel tank. And the last part was really coming hard. And there was a meeting, a stand-up around the desk. Of, How do we get another 800 pounds? And they were coming up with all kinds of ragged-edge ideas. And a fellow from the shop, a uh, younger kid from the shop, had apparently wandered by and stood there and was listening to this. And finally, as the list of options was diminishing, this this young fellow from the shop says, uh, why don't you paint, not paint the tank white? And there's silence. And finally, one of the engineers says, well, space uh, hardware is always painted white. And he says, well, why don't you not paint this space hardware white? <laughs> and somebody said, I wonder what that paint weighs. And so there's a mad dash off to the computers to see what the paint weighed. It weighed 800 pounds. <laughs> and, uh, Incredible. So with that stroke of genius, uh, the tank became orange, which orange is the color of the uh, spray on foam insulation that covered the tank. And it not only saved the paint weight, but saved the cost of painting it. And uh, also uh, there had been a lot of patches in the uh foam insulation in the early shuttle tanks because uh, it was hard to get the foam to stick to the aluminum. And uh, so it, it looked terrible. And so uh, it put a lot of pressure on to quit having patches. And so the tank uh, was probably safer and uh, certainly looked better. It was cheaper and lighter. And all because somebody from outside the box agreed to speak up. That's a, that's a great story. How long were you at uh, at Martin Marietta? About a decade or so? Yeah, it was almost a little under 10 years. Oh. And uh, I initially was in the headquarters. And uh, then I was asked to go out and run the astronautics group. I'd been working a lot in tactical systems, uh, tactical military. And uh, the astronautics group uh, where Titan was being done and some classified space stuff uh and some other systems it was out in denver headquartered there had locations uh, in uh, florida new orleans and california and so i ran it that dumped me in the middle of strategic warfare uh, strategic icbms and the space program and so on and the shuttle and the likes and uh, i was there as you said almost a decade well i was Martin Marietta, 10 years. I was in Denver, three years. 
and I had been told when I took the job I would be there five years. And one day I'm getting, we had a barbershop in the plant, and the uh, it was called Rumor Central because that's where all the rumors were spread. And the barbershop was so you'd rather spend your Saturdays getting your hair cut. You could run down there and work late in the evening or whatever and get get an appointment and get a haircut. So I gave my haircut such as it was. And the barber says, I hear you're going back to the headquarters. And I said, oh, no, not right. I am I was told by the CEO I was here. I worked for, directly with the CEO, uh, Tom Panala. He told me I was going to be here for five years, so I wasn't going to have to keep moving the family all the time. And he said, the barber said, well, that's not what I hear. And about two days later, Tom calls me and says, uh, we're going to ask you to come back to the headquarters and run the information systems group. That was a new group the company was starting up. And so uh, next thing I know, I'm back to the headquarters running the information systems group, which was totally new to me. I'm an aerospace guy. And I did that for a little less than a year and then was asked to become president of of, uh, Martin Marietta, the company, and then uh, was president for... uh, I'm not sure it was only six months or so when they asked me to be CEO, none of which I expected. And uh, one day uh, my secretary came in and said they would want you in the board room, the board's meeting. That wasn't totally uncommon, but uh, it didn't happen every day. And so I wandered into the board room and everybody stood up and applauded. And I looked to see who followed me into the board room. And they said, congratulations, you're now the CEO of Martin Marietta and the chairman. And so that's the way I got that job. Hadn't planned on it at all. As a matter of fact, my boss was in line for that job, and I always assumed he would get it. He's a really good guy. And uh, anyway, that's and he was good enough. He agreed to work for me for a while to, during a transition. And uh, then I worked at Mark Marietta for a while, and then uh, Berlin Wall fell. And I don't know whether you want to talk about that or not, but it fell and sort of changed my career along with it. Oh yeah, well yeah, we're definitely gonna get to that. I wanna, I wanna spend a little bit more time in the '80s first uh, before we get to that. Okay. Uh, so back in the in the '80s, can you just talk a little bit about how the defense industry worked back then, as far as like the, the business models and types of contracts and things? And it seems like there was a lot of competition, but there was also a lot of opportunities. Well, well you put it right. Uh... Let's see, who was, oh, Cap Weinberger was Secretary of Defense. And uh, Cap and Reagan, of course, uh, were greatly increasing the defense budget. So from a business standpoint, it was a terrific time to be in the defense industry. There was lots of business. And uh, from a uh, personal standpoint, though, uh, for most of the leadership, it was a terrible time to be in the defense industry, ironically. Because Cap, who was a friend of mine, I chaired the Defense Science Board for him uh, later. And uh, but Cap uh, uh, felt that he had to prove that the, the, the Defense Department was getting its money's worth uh, with all this increased funding that the public was putting into defense, the Congress. And one of his ways of doing that was to uh, uh, really jump on things that the defense industry had done wrong. And doing complicated things like we were doing, the industry, occasional things did go wrong. But anyway, Cap and his team, uh, as I say, these were friends of mine, but they found something at every company that where uh, you'd done something wrong. With it. General Dynamics, they charged too much for a screwdriver. At Lockheed, it was a toilet seat. You may remember all this on an airplane. And where I was working, uh, the problem was a... Uh, Oh, we had sold six rolls of tape for like $600 that should have cost about $15. And uh, this story is kind of minuscule, but it's it sets the tone of the era. And uh, so I'm at my desk one day, and the CEO calls me, the CEO of uh, Martin Marietta, and says, uh, I just got a letter from the the Secretary of Defense saying we'd been selling rolls of tape for $600. It should cost less than a tenth of that. And uh, I said, Tom, I'm insulted. If you think if I were going to cheat the government, it would be on rolls of tape. Uh, You've got the wrong guy running this job. (laughs) 
And uh, anyway, he laughed, and uh, so I said, I'll go look into it. And so I I got our inspector uh, and said, I've got this letter just sent to me, and uh, it says we're cheating the government on rolls of tape. Will you find out the story? And I'll make this short, but anyway, this was a fairly independent group that does the inspection. And they come back, and they've got all the correspondence and paper that they showed to me. It turns out we got an RFP from the government that was probably a quarter of an inch thick, uh, asking us to provide six rolls of tape that had the word fuel put all along them every three inches or something. And they were to be used to wrap the fuel lines in a Titan silo. And the government wanted us to provide the tape. Well, it, our people had done the right thing. There was a letter attached that we had sent back to the procurement people in the government and said that we actually don't make that tape. We procure it. And I still remember the name of the company. It was the West Tape and Label Company. It's been printed in my brain. So we told the government, we buy it from the West Tape and Label Company, and we've checked, and you can buy it from them too, and it'll cost you $6 a roll or whatever it was. Just tell them you want the Martin Marietta part number 6XYZ and so on, and you can do that. And so they sent a letter to the tape and label company, which we have a copy of. And uh, the tape and label company comes back and says, we sell tape and labels. We don't comply with all of your rules and regulations. It would cost us a fortune to comply with all the things we have to comply with in order to qualify to sell you this tape. And it was in that they sent them the same RFP they sent us. And so the tape and label company refused to do business with the government. So there's a handwritten note from the government procurement officer to our procurement department that says the government won't sell us the tape and label. We're desperate to close the Titan silo. We need the tape to wrap the line as it's a new silo. We want to get it online. And will you please provide us the tape? And so we said, okay. And we documented all our costs of complying with that we don't buy diamond bearings from South Africa and all these things that we complied with and the legitimate cost of the tape when you put in the, our, all our compliance was cheap. We charged the government. And so we charged the government. And of course, that got us in hot water, too. We got beat up for that. But that was sort of the environment at that time. And there were big arguments about uh, what kind of contracts you should use. You mentioned that uh, when McNamara came in, he was a big believer in total package procurement which meant that they let a contract for the, the, F, the new uh, whatever it was uh, system. It was a single contract, a firm fixed price, and it covered the uh, research and development uh, and the production and some of the operations. Needless to say, it was a huge contract, and uh, it nearly bankrupt most of the industry. I mean, because doing research and development that nobody's ever done before on a fixed price contract, uh, the only way you could do that is pad the contract enormously, which raises the cost of things wildly. It also guarantees that the least knowledgeable contracts will win the bid because they can put in a nice low bid. And so that was a disaster. <laughs> and, That's uh, an interesting byproduct, right? <laughs> yeah, it really was. It, uh, and so the uh, the industry was being destroyed. And uh, so they gave up on total package procurement. And then we went to, uh, well, I can't remember, but it was a cost reimbursable kind of contracts, which made more sense. But they had their problems. And uh, we went through whole cycles of how do you do business with the government and never did find a perfect solution. And Having spent nine years with the government myself, I had some appreciation for the problems the government was facing and was trying to be helpful in that regard. Uh, but it was a very tough time in the industry, except that the sales were going up and the losses going up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I would imagine you have a lot of, at this point, from what you were saying, a lot of scar tissue. And so you're I think you started writing some of these things down that you end up publishing as a set of uh, the Augustine laws. It actually has its own Wikipedia page. Just not, there's one for you, obviously, but there's also one just for the laws that you wrote. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Your vignette about the firm fixed price contracts being problematic. And so you get the 
you get the people who don't know what they're doing come in and underbid, and they win the contracts, and then it goes sideways, right? Well, Augustine's Law 33, fools rush in where incumbents fear to tread, is the perfect explanation for that. Yeah, it fits what we were talking about, doesn't it? <laughs> it sure does. <laughs> well, the laws, uh, the first one that was written when I was with the government, and it was probably the most famous one, is the one about the cost of an airplane escalating with time. And then when I left the government, I was writing these things for fun and just for articles in magazines and the likes. And uh, I was out in San Diego. Uh, I was supposed to uh, go out to sea on a Navy ship. Uh, we were providing some stuff for the Navy. And uh, I'd been asked by the Admiral to go out and take a look. So I was in San Diego, and all of a sudden my side starts hurting. And everything is an accident in my life. But anyway, I... I got a taxi and said, my side hurts. Uh, you got to find me a doctor. And anyway, I, he found me a doctor uh, who I, of course, had no idea who he was. And he said, you got appendicitis. We've got to get you in the hospital. And uh, so I, instead of going to see, go in the hospital. And my daughter in high school, uh, now a lawyer, but she was in high school. She had always been telling me I should take some of these articles that I've been writing and write a book. And I said, oh, I don't have time to do that. And so while I'm recovering from my appendix problem, she stacks up some of my papers and gives them to me. And I start writing while I'm recovering. And I, I got into it and I had so much fun that it became what I did when flying on airplanes instead of uh, doing paperwork like I should be. And so I wrote the book basically on airplanes. And, uh, uh, when I was going to come out with it, the company marketing people were very upset because I was book is, of course, quite critical of government in a constructive way, I hope. And the marketing people didn't want my name on a book that was tearing the government apart and uh, and the industry. And so the, but the publisher said, no, it's got to be under your name. And so we did it under my name and the marketing people were quite upset. But anyway, I was concerned the day the book came out. Anyway, from the very beginning, the people who enjoyed it the most were the people in the government. And uh, <laughs> a, a short story about that, uh, the chief of staff of the Army, which was, of course, one of our big customers. Uh, gosh, the name has gotten away from me now. Uh, this would have been in the mid-'80s, I guess. And uh, he uh, was giving a speech that I was in the audience. And somehow, I guess he found out I was in the audience. And, he held up my book during a speech that he had under the podium and said, uh, I was just reading Augustine's book. And I thought, well, this, this is fantastic. I'm really getting some publicity here. And next thing he says is, I don't think much of it. I thought, oh, my gosh, this goes my job and everything. <laughs> and he said, yeah. He said, I particularly didn't like the law in there that says that rank times IQ is a constant. <laughs> and uh, anyway, there, those things they became favorites in the government, and I still get a check every quarter. For the, the book's 50 years old, and it still sells. It's in half a dozen languages and about eight or nine editions, and uh, it still sells. Now, I wouldn't want to have to live on the check I get, but uh, <laughs> I still get a little check every quarter. Oh, that's amazing. For, for those who aren't tracking, the your most famous, uh, your most famous law which the way it's listed now, I think it's it shows up as like 16 or something. You said it's the first one. Uh, I have it here, and I'm happy to to read it back no, to you. But you're the one who. Please do it. Well, you're the. I, I'd love to hear you quote yourself if you can remember that that famous law about the aircraft. Is this the one about the cost of airplanes? Yes. Yep. It's okay if you can't. So, I can only remember the parts of it. You'll have to help me. In the year 2054. Okay, in the year 2054, a single fighter aircraft will equal the entire cost of the defense budget. And so we will only be able to buy one aircraft a year, and it will have to be shared between the, the military services. And during leap year, uh, the Marines will have to give it up by uh, the extra day of the year or whatever it was. <laughs> You're still pretty sharp. You're still pretty sharp. That's 50 yeah. years old. <laughs> I, I haven't thought of that in a long time, but 
it was a lot of fun writing it, and I didn't expect anybody to read it when it caught on. And it, it caught on way beyond the defense industry. I was asked to speak to the Physicians Association and the Bar Association and, because a lot of things, uh, sadly, uh, have brought applicability. And I started a second edition years ago and had an agreement with the Harvard Press to print it. And then, unfortunately, my the the Berlin Wall fell, and I didn't have time to write. But I still have a stack here that, uh, if I ever get time, uh, I would love to write a second edition. I got lots of material. You you should have plenty of time. <laughs> oh, I've worked harder since I retired than, <laughs> than I ever did when I worked. And uh, as I as I mentioned, Mike, I'm a engineer, and uh, our education was limited and uh, do you know the meaning of pro bono could you tell me <laughs> that's that's been my problem and since i've retired uh, my secretary has told me that uh, i've chaired or co-chaired 44 investigations or studies mostly for the government and uh, number 44 is sitting here right now on my desk that i my next two weeks are going to be spent working on the final report that's a uh review for the Congress uh, of whether NASA is prepared to uh, take on the challenges of establishing a presence on the moon and putting humans on Mars. And that's that's my main current project. But there have been 44 of all different fields. Is that uh, is that Laura that you're talking about, your secretary? Your yes. Uh-huh. Um, so for the listeners aren't tracking, I, I was working with uh, with Laura to, to arrange uh uh, to arrange this uh, meeting with Norm, and then I had to convince to do this interview, and I, I I got to talking with her, and I'm like, oh yeah, that's great, and she says, yeah, he's uh, you know been d- doing a lot of work, worked him for a long time, and then she says she drops the bomb. She goes, I've been his assistant since 1987. I'm like, oh my god, I didn't, re- <laughs> I had no idea that she was that, that, that she had been around like were you that long um, or yeah. that experience. I had no idea. Well, boy, it's important to me because it. Gosh, I didn't realize it was 1987, but I guess that's right. It helps me so much because I say, you, you you remember that awful speech I gave on so-and-so 25 years ago to so-and-so? Could you get me a copy of that? She knows exactly which one I mean. Man. Uh, so you, you, so first of all, we're going to have to come back to this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to stay in touch after this interview. Make sure you get that, uh, the sequel. For your August season laws uh, published. That should be your goal in 2024 is to get it oh, published. Oh boy, it, it took me five or 10 years to do the first one. <laughs> well, it's been 50 years. I mean, that's a pretty good time between the first edition and the second, right? It should be, right. <laughs> well, I've got some fun laws that uh, I'll disclose publicly one here. It, it's been disclosed only once. It's the most recent one. Uh, I revealed it in a speech to the faculty at MIT. And it turns out that people have kept track of the average grade point average in universities of students ever since the days I was in college. And if you plot it on a log versus time paper, logarithmic scale versus time, it comes out to be a perfectly straight line that when I was... Uh, in college, the average GPA was 2.33, and now it's 3.22. And so the grade point average has gone up a whole grade point uh, since I started. And somebody, there is another group of people who have kept track of the number of hours students spend outside of the classroom on academic subjects, on their classwork. And it shows that the numbers of hours spent by students uh, on their classwork has declined uh, precipitously since I was in school. And so I've cross-plotted those two plots, and I can prove uh, convincingly that if the students studied four hours less a week, everybody would have a 4.0 average. And I mean, I've got the data to prove that. And so (laughs) that didn't go over well with the MIT faculty, but they knew it was true. (laughs) That's great. Oh, one last thing real quick, because you said you had been talking with Harvard Press uh, for the for this book. How does it make you feel as a Princeton graduate? And you, <laughs> you lectured at Princeton for a while, too. Did they know? Well, 
I have an honorary degree from Harvard that I'm very proud of. So okay. uh, no problem. I, if, if it gets to basketball, where my granddaughter played for Princeton, then that's that's a different story. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. So we've gotten through the '80s, and you're the CEO of of Martin Marietta. Maybe or maybe not at this time. And we're gonna fast forward a little bit to 1993, the Last Supper. And so uh, I'll set the stage, and then I'll hand it to you to tell the story. You were literally had a seat at the table for the Last Supper. I'll set the stage. The Berlin Wall had fallen. Uh, the Cold War was coming to an end. America coming through is a superpower. It's a unipolar world. And so there was a peace dividend uh, politically, which is, hey, we have such a, a huge technological advantage that we can actually afford to skip a generation of, of this tech development and then use that money on other things. And so that started with, I think Les Aspen was the Secretary of Defense. He came in into the role and had this massive budget cut. And the budget was starting to rescind a little bit anyways, but he had this uh, this budget cut in early 93, and it was about 60, 65% less, I think, than the Cold War peak in the mid 80s that we were talking about before. And he had initiated this thing called the Bottom Up Review, uh, which is basically trying to make sense of this, but this, uh, these budget cuts. And it turns out they didn't really make a whole lot of sense in the fall of that year. You get an invitation to have dinner at the Pentagon. So I'm going to hand it to you to tell this story. This is fascinating. Okay. Do you want me to start in right there or should, should I go back a little bit? You start wherever you want. You start wherever okay. you want. Let me let a little, uh, preface to that. It's 1987 that I've, just become uh, CEO of Martin Marietta. And the uh, uh, defense budget has been booming under uh, under Reagan. And uh, it became fairly apparent, at least to me, that the defense budget was going to decline a lot. And it was also apparent that Russia, I had just written a book with a Ken Edelman on the, the Cold War. And it had become apparent to us that Russia was in a lot of trouble. Nowhere near the trouble they were in. I mean, I don't want to even suggest I had an idea that the Soviet Union would collapse. But it was clear that the defense budget in this country was going to have to be cut a lot. And so uh, uh, with that as background, uh, we started preparing for this cut in the defense budget. And uh, So now you can fast forward to 1993. I'm CEO of Martin Maria. Uh, business is declining. Uh, and I get a letter. Once again, these things all just appear as changes of course. I started out to be a forest ranger and I wound up running Lockheed Martin. I mean, it, that's my life. But so I'm reopening my mail. And there's a letter where Les Aspen is inviting me and uh, a group of about, I don't know, 15 uh, CEOs of defense companies aerospace and shipping and shipbuilding and so on, uh, to dinner at the Pentagon. Well, that had never happened to me before. I'd never been invited to dinner in the Pentagon by the secretary. And uh, as it turned out, when we got together, talked to each other, uh, nobody else had either. And just as an aside, that an interesting fact is compared with other industries that I, where I serve on boards of directors, in the defense industry, the CEOs, because they're all engineers, they're all aerospace types, they're all deal with the defense department. Uh, most of us are friends, and uh, we're hugely competitive. Uh, you got to be because if if you lose the F thirty five, as McDonnell Douglas found out, you're out of business. And so the competition is intense, but we're friends. And uh, so people said, "Why are we being invited to the Pentagon? Nobody knows." So we go to the Pentagon that night to dinner at the secretary's dining room, two steps off of his office. And uh, for some reason, I'm seated next to the, the less. And uh, I said, you know, this is really nice. Uh, these are tough times and we all welcome a free meal. And I said, but why have you invited us? I assume it's not just to be sure that we're well fed. And he says, well, you're going to find out in about five minutes uh, when dinner is done. And so we had a nice dinner. I don't remember what we had. I've been asked that. I don't remember. But anyway, uh, 
we go in the next room, which is a tiny viewing room to present slides and stuff on the wall. Slides in those days, uh, or may, might even been greasy <laughs> before that. <laughs> Bill Perry made the presentation, and John Deutsch was sort of the backup. And John was director of defense research and engineering, and Bill was deputy secretary of defense to less. And so uh, Bill Perry makes the presentation and uh, he puts up a chart that has a list uh, on the left side of it, a vertical list uh, of major products that the Defense Department purchased at that time. And for example, it would say fighter aircraft, uh, defense missiles, uh, ballistic missiles, uh, uh, aircraft carriers, and so on. And there was, as I remember, there were 16 items on the list. And then there was a second column that said, and he showed these, I think, one at a time, as I recall. But anyway, the second column was the number of suppliers the Defense Department had at that time, 83, at that time that were supplying each of the items of equipment. So there were like a dozen suppliers of tactical aircraft. And uh, you go down the list, there were three of this and six of that and so on. Then he added a third column that's based on the current defense projected budget, how many suppliers they could afford to have in each category. And the reason that was important to the Defense Department, as Bill told us, and it's quite true, that when you have, I'll take tactical aircraft builders, say there were a dozen, when you have a dozen suppliers of tactical aircraft and you're buying very few tactical aircraft, you have a whole lot of companies with plants that are almost empty and they're building some little piece of that aircraft for another contractor. And so they have empty plants, but they all have a headquarters, they have a CEO, a president, uh, go down the line. And so overheads are going out of sight. And the Defense Department is under huge pressure from the media, the public, and the Congress saying that we can't afford you. And uh, that the, one of the objectives of winning the Cold War was that we now have a, you know, a defense dividend. That was spoken of commonly just in earlier years. People spoke of other wars, peace in our time. And we don't need to spend much on defense, and we can now spend money on all these other things that really need to be taken care of. They were legitimate things, most of them, in my view. So the Defense Department was under this enormous pressure to cut the defense budget, and they couldn't do it if they had 15 builders of aircraft and six of the next thing and so on. And so he very candidly said, uh, we can't afford all of you, and a bunch of you are going to have to go out of business and you guys run the business and get paid to do that. We don't. And so we're not going to tell you who goes out of business. That's up to you. But we can't afford you all. You better get together and shut down a lot of the businesses. And we're planning on you doing that. And you better do it fast because the patience of the Congress and the public is not very great. And they're looking forward to spending this defense dividend. Well, when I heard that, I thought, from a long-term standing, one of my hobbies is reading history. I've got a room full of history of books in my house. And if there's anything you learn from history, it's from the time the first two humanoids appeared on the Earth, on our planet, they threw rocks at each other. And that's been the case ever since. People just don't get along very well. And it's sad, but if you look at history, there have been wars almost continuously uh, here, there, or everywhere. And so to me, the idea that we're going to have peace in our time or a defense dividend uh, was just wrong. But Bill knew that. I mean, he had no choice. The choice was to cut the defense budget. And he was telling us to go do it and do it by combining companies and shutting down factories and shutting down headquarters and so that the industry was operating efficiently. And of course, that was kind of a shock to all of us in the room. Uh, fortunately, the company I was at was pretty well prepared because we had seen a big cut in defense coming for right after Weinberger left. And so we'd been preparing. We'd been building our uh, 
what we call it, our uh, armor magazine or something like that, where we were trying to save money, put money aside. And so we'd stacked up a pretty good uh, stack of money uh, to deal with this kind of a problem. Okay, so uh, we leave the room, and uh, everybody is talking to each other. Boy, this is a disaster. This is going to really be hard on you. And everybody was talking about how hard it was going to be on everybody else. Nobody realized it was going to be hard on them, too. And the next morning, a reporter asked me what what happened at the dinner. And I said, out of the spur of the moment, I said it was the Last Supper. And that became the name that kind of described it. It was the Last Supper for the defense industry. So companies started buying each other. And the next day, I would happen to be in the Pentagon and, and said, can I have a copy of the chart that the secretary presented last night at the last or at the dinner? And they said, sure, it was unclassified. There was nothing secret about it. And so I thought this was so valuable. I put a copy in my safe at the bank we have because I thought this is a historic document because the day will come when we're going to regret what we're doing. And I even gave speeches at the time on that. Not that we're going to regret it, but that given the choice, I would rather have 12 strong aerospace companies than uh, certainly one or two or three. If the choice is to have 15 weak companies or 12 weak companies or a couple of strong companies, I'll go with the strong companies, but I don't like either choice. And anyway, with the industry set out, and I was one of those who, I guess, played a leading role in shutting down companies and combining companies and trying to make them more efficient. And we were very successful at Lockheed Martin. We combined all their parts of 17 companies, significant companies. And shut down headquarters, shut down uh, factories. And the industry as a whole, if my memory serves me correctly, and I think it does in this case, 40% uh, of the employees in the industry left the industry. And 70% of the companies uh, were either went out of business or were absorbed because the companies really had no choices and uh, other than to buy, sell, or die. And uh, our company chose to buy. And uh, that was, that's the whole story in itself. But we started buying companies, other companies, some other companies started buying. Fortunately, a lot of the companies sold, which was the best strategy in the short term, because you, this was a terrible time to be in the defense business. Uh, you didn't get paid much. Uh, defense companies then sold for 25 cents on the dollar of sales. Previously, it had been a dollar per dollar. And so it was like a 75% drop in uh, it. Our company chose not to buy on the cheap. We paid going prices at that time, which were 75% low. But we didn't bottom fish. We tried to buy good companies and we paid fair prices. And we sort of built a reputation as a company that just didn't talk about buying and selling. We did it. And this was a huge change to me personally. I, I'm an aeronautical engineer, space guy. And my last five years of my career were spent dealing with bankers and lawyers almost entirely. And Dan Tellup, the grand Lockheed, and I, he was an engineer. And so many of us that worked together on buying and selling, Bill Anders, General Dynamics, and I could name a whole bunch of people. And uh, anyway, uh, the industry shrunk, thinking that it would never, we would not need a large industry again. And sadly, uh, that was wrong. I know you don't follow the defense industry too closely anymore because you're doing you know, other things now, but right now I would say the past couple of years, there's been this uh, realization is something needed to happen. There's probably no good options. Like you said, trying to unwind that to rebuild the defense industrial base that has basically collapsed on itself is really, really hard. And when you look at the, valuations and profit margins and just how the government itself is just a really finicky customer to even deal with. It, just the, the pain points of trying to even get back into the industry to rebuild it are just monumental. It takes a certain talent of people. I mean, you don't, when I got out of college, the place you wanted to work was a defense. That was the leading edge of technology. Today, the leading edge of technology is at Silicon Valley and Boston and uh, so on, Huntsville, Houston. And uh, the aerospace companies today have to compete for employees with exactly the same people who are out in Silicon Valley. 
and uh, it makes it very tough to enter the industry or to grow either in borrowing money from banks or from shareholders or f finding people. And so the industry has changed an awful lot since the Last Supper. It's a, a, a totally new environment. And at the time of, uh, well, shortly after the Last Supper, when I would talk about this subject, I, if I can remember right, I used to say that we had three choices, no more. Integrate, disintegrate, or disappear. And that was really it. And so you could buy other companies, but be in a bad business, or you could uh, sell at a, a huge loss and get out of the business, or you could just gradually wait and die. And uh, a few of us chose the first. Uh, a lot of companies sold us, chose the second, and uh, very few chose the third. And that gives us the industry we've got today, which was not the one I think anybody intended in the Defense Department or the Congress or certainly in the industry. It, it was a disaster in the industry at that time. So today, instead of a dozen or so uh, makers of fighter aircraft, there are two or three. And, uh, you go down the list and some of them, on the, I looked at the list the other day and there are a number of entries on the list that uh, Bill put up during the Last Supper on the, the table that showed how many companies we can afford supplying this item. There were a number of ones where they could only afford one. And I mean, that means no competition. Uh, that's a disaster. And But that was the world. Uh, I don't fault the Defense Department at all. I mean, they played a bad hand as well as they could. But it's given us, a, I think, a very tough situation today where we can't even build enough artillery shells to keep a modest-sized war going. I think it took us uh, 11 months to deliver 31 tanks. Now, I was very much involved in that tank. That was called the MBT-70 at the time. The, it's known as the, uh, the, uh, the, the main battle tank or the... Uh, M1 Abrams? It's M1 Abrams, thanks. The Abrams after named after the chief of staff I worked with. And a uh, fine man. And uh, it took 11 months to deliver 31 tanks. Well, it, it, the kind of wars we didn't been before, the number of tanks was measured in thousands. Uh, during World War II, we built 100,000 aircraft in one year. And I'll grant you, they're, they're, they're not F-35s, but there were 100,000 airplanes we built with a GDP that well, it's probably a fifth of what it is today. And uh, today, uh, our manufacturing capability in this country, aside from defense, has declined substantially. Defense manufacturing has declined very substantially. The ability to attract talent is challenging. It's a totally new world that we we find ourselves in uh, today. And... Uh, I think we're we're due for some tough times, and when other dictators, of which there seem to be a growing number, uh, see the struggles we're having in Israel and in the Middle East and elsewhere, they learn lessons from that, and uh, I don't think we're going to like those lessons that they learn. So I, I don't want to be a pessimist, uh, but. Somebody told me that a, a pessimist is an optimist who has a knowledge of the facts. And I like to think I do, uh, from all these years, have some knowledge of the facts. And the other thing I was going to say, it's not just the number of systems that we have. And every time we give a tank to the uh, Middle East uh, or to, to Europe, that's a tank out of our inventory usually. And we're looking at China now, which was nothing 20 years ago uh, when these decisions were being made. And it, we, we also have looked at the quantity of systems and their age. The big five of the army that it uses today, it's big five, were developed uh, at the time I was under secretary, assistant secretary for R&D of the army. That was the Apache helicopter, the uh, Bradley M1, the... Uh, the tank, uh, Abrams, uh, the Patriot, and so on down the line. 
They're all in the inventory today. They're the first line equipment. Now, they've all been upgraded, which is important. But you just can't upgrade a Volkswagen into a Ferrari. I mean, it can't be done. And those systems are 50, 60, 70 years old. The V-52 was being built by Boeing when I had just graduated from college and worked there. It was coming down the assembly line. That would have been, I won't even tell. It was a long time ago. <laughs> but... Uh, so the, system, the equipment is in limited numbers today. It's uh, unfortunately very expensive because you don't build many of them. You know, when you you build uh, 21, I think, B2s and one of the prior bomber, you only get one of it. And when you do that, the costs go out of sight. And so that's where we're living in. And uh, we're going to have to face up to, I think, pretty quickly. You'll be happy to hear that there's actually a national defense industrial base strategy that's coming out from the Pentagon to try to get their arms around all of the things that you've been talking about, of how, how the industry has atrophied. And so the chasing cost efficiency as sacrifice, effectiveness, resiliency, scale, all of those things that you would want in an industrial base to protect yourself. It's very important, and uh, I just hope it's not a five-year study. Uh, we, we need to get going. I have a feeling, Norm, if you were, if you were back in the game, and and this was, uh, and you're in your prime doing your thing in the defense industry, and and this was all the state of the industry, yeah, I have a feeling that you'd be finding a way uh, of, of what you would do to try to fix this. Well, at the time, I was making talks uh, about the fact that. Uh, we were putting ourselves in a precarious position and I'd rather have a dozen companies, even though I have to compete with them. Competing with 12 companies is not much different from competing with two good companies. And from an industry standpoint or as an American citizen, I felt that uh, I would make those speeches and then I'd go out and do exactly what I said we shouldn't be doing, uh, namely consolidating the industry as we were. But uh, I was one of the main consolidators. We weren't given a lot of choices. I don't blame the Defense Department. As I said, they 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 played the hand they had to play. Tough time. We are in the early 90s. You're CEO of, of Martin Marietta. We have the Last Supper. You consolidate, or you end up joining, merging with, with Lockheed and becoming the CEO of Lockheed. How did that relationship come about? How did that merger come about? When, uh, way back before the Berlin Wall fell, uh, I say way back a year or two before the Berlin Wall fell, I was, as you say, running Martin Marietta. And we put together a little group of about five of us, CEO, the CFO, the COO, the head of mergers and acquisitions for the company. And uh, we would meet uh, once every week or two to figure out when the budget declines, which we felt it was going to do. We had no idea the Soviet Union was going to go away and everything was going to explode. Uh, but anyway, we were making plans for a smaller defense industry. And we invite outside speakers to come in and talk to the five of us. We met my basement here at our house because you can't get anything strategic done in an office. There are too many interruptions. So we met here at the house and started putting together our uh, savings to be ready. And uh, over the years, uh, I had come to know uh, Dan Tellup, who had become CEO of Lockheed. And incidentally, a number of our customers explicitly said, you guys need to get together with Lockheed because you both supply us some of the similar items of equipment. And we need you both, your capabilities, but your two companies are too expensive dealing with both of you. And so if you guys could ever get together, that'd be fabulous. These are senior customers said this to me. Anyway, not based solely on that, but certainly influenced by it. We had put together during these meetings in my basement a, a notebook of companies that seemed to fit us pretty well and that things really, the bottom fell out. The budget did not turn back up. Who would we like to be uh, associated with? And we had our separate tabs for all these companies. And tab number one was Lockheed because we did 
fit each other very well in terms of what we did, our cultures, and so on. The problem was that was Lockheed was about twice our size. And I was afraid that if we went to Lockheed and said, Dan, why don't we put the two companies together? He'd say, that's a great idea. We'll buy you. <laughs> and uh, we didn't think it was in our shareholders' interest to just sell the company at 25% on the dollar. Anyway, uh, uh, Martin Marietta's view was that Lockheed would be the ultimate partner, but that we were too small. Uh, we had to, we had to bulk up, as was the term we used. Uh, and so we started buying other companies that were smaller than Lockheed. The first one was General Electric Aerospace, and then we went through buying a bunch of companies, and we got to where Lockheed and ourselves were almost the identical size. And we were about to buy Northrop Grumman, and that's a whole story in its own right. We were about to buy Northrop Grumman, and uh, oh, it's such a great story. I don't want to get too far into that to hear. <laughs> well, uh, let's hear it. Let's hear yeah. it. Okay. Uh, Martin Marietta was about to buy Northrop Grumman, and it was a, a done deal with Northrop Grumman. We had a handshake, and the lawyers had worked for a year. And we, had a, we had almost 300 lawyers working on the deal for nearly a year. We put the deal together and had it all set, uh, except for one thing that was have uh, the antitrust people in the government approve the deal. Well, they'd been approving all these deals. Boeing had just bought McDonnell Douglas. That Boeing with McDonnell Douglas was huge compared to Martin Marietta with almost anybody. And so uh, we were at this point going to buy uh, Northrop Grumman. And so we announced the deal as I was retiring as CEO. And I stayed on for a couple months as uh, chairman was all. And uh, the antitrust laws at the time said that the government had to either approve or disapprove a merger acquisition within 27 days, I think it was. But there was a loophole that in the 27th day, they could come to you we need you to agree to what well, the company could agree to more time. And they came to us and said, uh, you can either agree to more time uh, than the 27 days because we're not ready. They hadn't really done much of anything in the 27 days and said, but uh, if you'll give us an extension, that'd be great for everybody. But if you won't, the answer is uh, we're going to turn you down and we can go to court. Well, that was not a very attractive thing. So they, took more time, which the companies agreed to. So I put it a couple months, and then I leave. And so uh, while I was still there, I had our attorneys go to the, the Justice Department and say, do you have any major problems with this deal? Uh, I, I'm sure you have some things here and there that we can solve by selling pieces of companies. But do you have any major problem with the deal? The answer came back, no. Northrop did the same thing. And so we went ahead and I left. And the process went on and a year passes. And at the end of a year, the, the antitrust people in the Justice Department, together with the Defense Department, called a meeting of the management executives of, of Northrop Grumman and Martin Marietta. I was not one of them now. And But they called and said, would I come to the meeting because I'd been so deeply involved in this? Uh, this would make me an insider, but I don't deal in the company stock anyway, so okay. And so there was a, a meeting at the Pentagon. They didn't serve dinner at this one. Uh, and, uh, oh, the night before, I asked the lawyers, these, these are hundreds of lawyers, law firms all over the country that have been working on this. I said, what's the worst thing they can tell us tomorrow? And they said, well, you could be told that you have to sell such and such a piece of the business you're buying. Well, fine, we were prepared to do that. It was a small piece. But they did introduce a conflict of interest, I think, right now, a trust issue. And so we went into the meeting thinking this was going to be a good meeting. And the fellow from the antitrust folks stood up and said that uh, uh, they decided to stop the deal, terminate it, shut it off. They made it sound like uh, 
the two companies wanted to do this. And I remember Kent Cressa gave a very good talk. He said, do you, do you think I'd like to sell my company and uh, lose my job and my, my, the people I work with jobs? I, this is not something we want to do. It's something we've been told to do. And uh, the antitrust people said, well, that was a long time ago. And uh, said, we're going to shut the deal off, which they did. And uh, Northrop Grumman sued the government. Martin Marietta did not sue the government. And uh, so that, uh, and of course, Northrop Grumman soon figured out that suing your best customer is not a real good deal. And so they withdraw their lawsuit. And uh, the deal dies, dead or the doornail. And uh, we, were sh we had shown all kinds of data reviewed by the government that showed we could save a billion dollars a year by combining the two companies. Anyway, uh, the deal dies. And so the, while this is all going on, there are other deals underway that we've all got underway with other companies. So there's all kinds of deals being done by all the aerospace industry. The number one deal on our list was Lockheed, but we had not, at that point not talked to Lockheed, but we were now ready to do it because we were big enough to talk to them as an equal. And anyway, the best and final bid on Northrop Grumman, which was a very public deal. So Dan Tellup calls me. It was a Sunday afternoon, and he says, before you give all your money to Northrop Grumman, we ought to talk. Uh, maybe do something with Lockheed and Martin Marietta. And I said, well, that'd be terrific. Let's, let's do that. And Dan and I were friends. We'd been involved in the Aerospace Industry Association in a prior life, uh, chaired a committee to look at the nation's ballistic missile defense program, which Lockheed was doing a big part of. And so I, I was very familiar with Lockheed and knew the company. And we had studied it a lot, of course, uh, during this last few years. And so Dan and I said, well, let's get together and see what we can figure out. And uh, it's about this time Northrop Grumman disappeared. So Lockheed and Martin Marietta become particularly interesting. So we had a meeting uh, in Phoenix uh, because we wanted to be where nobody could know we were talking to each other. This whole, all this stuff was going on secretly, obviously, because you couldn't. If this leaked to the stock market, a bunch of crooks make money and a bunch of honest people lose money and the deal dies. And so it all has to be in secret. And so anyway, we started talking to Lockheed about putting the two companies together. And it was a natural match, natural fit. And so uh, we decided that uh, we should proceed with an effort to put it together. And uh, that effort to make a long story short, uh, it was a long story, actually, that I wanted <laughs> details that had to be worked and just issues that popped in from the outside. We decided to put the two companies together. We went up on Wall Street one day and announced that we were putting the two companies together. And uh, both companies' stocks did very well. And Martin, uh, Lockheed Martin's stock has, of course, done extremely well. I don't equate that with my leaving, incidentally. I equate that with the transaction. But, uh, <laughs> but it... Uh, it has done very well, and uh, the company has served the country well, I think. Uh, F-16s, F-22, F-35s, you go down the list, uh, Patriot, a bunch of the new systems that I'm not even partly familiar with. And uh, that was sort of the the big bang, if you will, of the the last of the mergers of the – because the, the antitrust people really put the kibosh on it. So how did you end up in charge of Lockheed Martin after it merged? So there are two guys trying to represent the two companies. There are a lot of people involved in the merger. It was a merger of equals. That's an interesting story, too. But anyway, there are a lot of people involved. But Dan and I are kind of trying to lead the way. And both engineers they were totally dealing with lawyers and bankers. And uh, they told us there are three things that wrecked most transactions. And they're not what you think they are. They're not money. Uh, they're what will be the name of the company, where will the headquarters be located, and who will be the CEO. And so the deal's coming along really well. And so Dan and I are on the phone as we got almost every day to kind of coordinate. And uh, the deal's been announced. And uh, 
So on the phone one day, one of us said, uh, you know, they told us these three things are usually what wrecks the deal. We ought to resolve those. Dan said, well, you've been uh, kind of a very visible person in the industry, and he hadn't. And we were good friends, trusted each other. And he said, why don't you start out as uh, CEO? And, excuse me, yeah, and I'll be chairman. Then with regard to where's the headquarters, both of us said, how quickly can we get out of California, which is where Lockheed's headquarters <laughs> was. So the, it became, we'll go to where Martin, where his headquarters was. We didn't want to start a new headquarters. And then the third question uh, was, uh, what will the name of the company be? And we said, well, it could be Martin Marriott and Lockheed, but that sounds like a law firm. That was the conversation we were having. And we don't want to do that. Marietta by now had nothing to do with Martin Marietta anymore. It was a history from the past. So we said, we'll drop Marietta and we'll put them in alphabetical order. And so in the course of two minutes, we solved all three of these problems that were supposed to be the big deal killers. And Dan and I remained close friends until the day he died. And uh, the business went on. And uh, at some point, I said to Dan, well, why don't you be CEO? And then when you get tired, he was older than I was. And I said, when you get ready to retire, if the board wants me, I'll be glad to do this. And anyway, he thought that was not a good idea. And he was looking forward to retiring at some point, not too far in the distance. And so uh, he stayed on a while to help with the company and did a great job. One other interesting aside, this was the kind of stuff that was going on all the time, but this one pops in my mind. The day we announced it, the two companies get letters from an attorney in San Diego, whose name I forget. As I said, the deal was a merger of equals. It was an error respect that almost the identical amount of money went to the two shareholders, sets of shareholders. The jobs were filled almost equally from both companies, uh, the senior jobs. It was just a merger of equals. And uh, so we get this letter from this Martin Marietta from a lawyer in San Diego who says that uh, it's not a merger of equals. You have sent, sold yourself to Lockheed and you didn't get a premium because there are no premiums in workers of these equals like there are in acquisitions. And you didn't get a premium. And in this case, the premium would be billions of dollars. And so we are suing you on behalf of your shareholders who didn't get the billions of dollars. And uh, turns out the same day, Lockheed gets the same letter, except with Lockheed substituted for Martin Marietta. Can you imagine this? Talk about golf. <laughs> so he tells Lockheed, they sold and sold to Martin Marietta. Martin Marietta sold yourself to Lockheed. We're suing you each. And neither was true. Certainly both were true. And so we get into that becomes a sideshow that's going on while we're trying to build a new company. So Dan and I are, uh, I'm trying to think of that. We're sitting in my office in Washington because that's where most of the action was. Uh, we were with a group of lawyers, the two engineers. And Dan and I are saying, we're going to fight this guy to the end. I mean, we'll take it to the Supreme Court because obviously they can't both be right. And uh, the lawyer said, well, you guys may want to settle down and think about this a little bit. He said, uh, you're right. They can't both be correct. And they said, he sued you in California. And in California, they don't like big companies. And so that's where you start. And he said, furthermore, this is a case that literally could get to the Supreme Court. It will undoubtedly be appealed by one party or the other. And if you're lucky, the appeal could be over a year. It could take five, four or five years to settle the appeal. And during that time, you're running a company that nobody knows who owns a company. When people sign up for jobs with you, they don't know what they're working for Lockheed or for Martin Marietta or for Lockheed Martin, the people you're trying to hire. When you try to go to banks for to borrow or go to shareholders to sell your stock, they don't know whose stock they're buying. And it may be five years before they find out. And with that, the attorneys told us, it said, uh, you would be very wise to let us go see if we can settle. Well, both of us were furious. But obviously, it was the right thing to do. So we turned the attorneys loose. A month or two later, they're back. And they said, uh, we've been able to settle this. 
And we said, great, uh, what, what, what's the settlement? They said, well, you each pay that lawyer $32 million. And uh, Dan and I have each had a fit. Wow. They, they said, that's your choice. It was kind of like the choice Bill Perry had. Jeez. And so we paid. And uh, that was the, the final blockage to creating Lockheed Martin. And uh, the people got together. They worked together. The, at that time, the odds of making a uh, merger or acquisition work were 80% chance of failure. Lockheed Martin was one of the few that really succeeded. The teams of both companies came together. and We'd been bitter competitors, uh, bitter competitors. But we did come together. And uh, you have Lockheed Martin as you have it today, of which I'm very proud. As you should be. That's a fascinating story. Thanks for sharing. You, you ended up leaving, though, after a few years of, of being the CEO and, and the, the late 90s. What, what was the reason that you decided to leave the defense industry? Sure, I'm being very candid with you here, and uh, as I said, I, I, I started out to be a forest ranger, and that didn't work, and so then I wanted to be uh, an engineer, and all of a sudden I discovered I'm not an engineer anymore, I'm a business person. What I was doing didn't have much to do with engineering, which was kind of disappointing, and all the company I loved, and it was doing great, and the board was a great board we put together. Something I had always wanted to do on the side at some point was to teach and i wanted to teach eighth grade algebra the reason for that is that if you want to go become an engineer or a scientist eighth grade algebra is the pivot point that if you don't take algebra and pass it in about eighth grade uh, you're never going to be a scientist or an engineer because you can't say well i'll skip algebra and i'll start with calculus a couple of years from now, it doesn't work that way. My daughter, who's an attorney, decided to be an attorney her senior year in college, but in engineering and science, that doesn't work. And so it has always distressed me how many kids have terrible math teachers in eighth grade, usually the football coach who's told, given a math algebra book and told, go teach algebra. They don't want to teach it. The kids hate it. And so the country doesn't have enough engineers and scientists. That's a whole new story, the, one of my side issues that I've devoted much of my retirement to. Anyway, I wanted to teach eighth grade algebra. So I've decided I'll, it's time to move on. The company's doing great, doesn't need me. And so I tell the board I want to uh, retire. And we had good people to replace me. And so uh, I retire. And now I have time to start looking around well, it turns out I live in Maryland, and in Maryland, like a lot of states I now know, you can't teach without being a member of the teachers union, and you can't get in the teachers union without having a teaching certificate uh, from a teaching university. Well, my degree was in aeronautical engineering, and my career was mostly in aerospace and management at the end. And so I can't teach an eighth grade algebra course in Maryland. So... That was the end of it. Meanwhile, there, Maryland is dying to find algebra teachers. And so that option was out. And so now I'm starting to rethink the rest of my career, what, it, what I want to do with my retirement. And I get a call. These calls keep coming. This call comes from the Dean of Engineering at Princeton, Jim Way. And uh, Jim says, Norm, I just heard that you want to teach. And I said, uh, yeah, I do, but I'm not qualified. And he said, uh, you're not a very good candidate <laughs> to just say something like that. And uh, he said, would you consider joining the faculty at Princeton? And I said, well, I'd love to, uh, but I don't have a PhD. And he said, at Princeton, they won't worry about that. And he said, uh, would you join the faculty as a, as a lecturer with the rank of professor? And I said, boy, sign me up. I'll do that. So I went and did that for a couple of years. And then we had a tragedy in our family where I had to readjust where I was spending my time and get back to Washington. So uh, it, that only lasted a couple of years, although I had intended that to be my career until I retired. Love teaching, still keep contact with a lot of the students or some of the students. 
it was a great experience and hard work. I had no idea how hard it is to teach. Incredible. Just to read that back to you, Norm, <laughs> you spent four decades in the defense industry, culminating as the CEO of the world's largest defense aerospace company, retired to try to teach eighth grade algebra, was denied because you didn't have a teaching certificate, and then Princeton hired you to, to teach instead. And I taught seniors and graduate students at Princeton. <laughs> that's that's the world we live in. And when I first retired, before I got the call, uh, after the option of teaching eighth grade algebra died, and before the dean called me, I was thinking, what am I going to do with my future? And I thought, well, what are things I could really have an impact that are really important? The first one on my list was to try to do something to fix K through 12 education in America, which is just abysmal by global standards. And the other one was that, and I could give a whole speech on this, that America badly underinvests in research, basic research in particular. And so I thought, clearly not going to become a basic researcher, and I'm not going to become an educator, K through 12. And so I decided I'd spend the rest of my life, whatever runway I had left, trying to promote the quality of K through 12 education in America and trying to get more money invested in research in America. And so those were my two retirement goals. And I've kept those alive throughout my retirement, even though I had all this other stuff going. Those are my two primary interests. Uh, what the Secretary of Education in Maryland who is a very capable person, extremely competent. And she told me that I was out. And I couldn't do it. That one message changed my career. And uh, the first one, I was in high school in Denver, Colorado, where I went to a very large public high school. My class was bigger than uh, my class at Princeton. It was my senior year. One day, a teacher, Justin W. Briarly, teacher at East High, called me into his office. I'd never had him as a teacher. He was a bachelor gone to Columbia, grouchy old guy. And when I came in his office, I couldn't figure why he wanted to see me. And he said, what are you going to do when you get out of here? I hadn't thought a lot about it, but I said, I, I think I'd like to be a forest ranger. And he got all upset with me, he actually swore at me. And he said, that's not what you're going to do. Don't you have any ambition? You're wasting my time. Get out of here. And so I left. And I was I hadn't asked to go there, and I had certainly sort of didn't like getting thrown out. A week later, I get another note that Justin W. Briarly wants to see you. And I'm thinking he's going to ask me again, and I know the wrong answer. And so I go into his office, and he says, uh, he hands me two envelopes. And he says, this is what you're going to do. And one was an application, and one to, to Williams College, and one was to Princeton. And he said, go fill them out. That's what you're going to do. <laughs> And I said, even if I could get in a place like that, my family couldn't afford it. He said, if you can get in those places, they'll pay your way through. And so the next thing I know, I'm being interviewed at Princeton and, uh, and at Williams, but at Princeton, the particular one. And they said, what do you want to major in? And I said, forestry. I mean, <laughs> I, I had grown up in Colorado. I'd, spent, I'd been as far away as Kansas to my aunt and uncle's farm. And I, I mean, I was totally lost. And so I said forestry and everybody laughed and I couldn't figure out why they're all laughing. And so somebody says, uh, well, we don't teach forestry at Princeton. And so I said, well, what do you teach that's like forestry? And somebody said uh, uh, geological engineering. And so I said, okay, I'll study that. And so I studied geological engineering through my freshman year. And then I met a guy on a train who was a senior at the high school I'd gone to who I'll tell you the whole story, he was rather drunk. Uh, I was coming back from a, a thing in New York, back to Princeton one night, and he was coming back. It was a Saturday night. He, he was rather drunk, but I recognized <laughs> him as having gone to my high school. And he told me he was studying aeronautical engineering and that that's where the future was, and that's what I ought to be doing. So the following Monday, I switched from geological engineering to aeronautical engineering. So that's kind of, I bounced from forestry to geological to aeronautical to space to business to uh, uh, to teaching, uh, not teaching in algebra though. That was, that's the hole in my career. Well, I mean, we'll get you there someday. 
<laughs> after 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 you write the, well, I gotta the, do the, the book the second edition for your book after that after that <laughs> <laughs> gotta do that <laughs> there may be a chapter on forestry i'll, I'll work on that <laughs> so i've told you more than you want to hear Inkutel is uh is near and dear to my heart as mike knows because i briefly ran the army venture capital initiative we called it the army venture capital corporation which was created by congress in 2002 to be inkutel for the dod but unlike inkutel was a was a bit of a disaster but i would love to hear how you helped set up inkutel okay it starts with a phone call like all these other things uh I have retired from uh, Lockheed Martin, and I'm in the process of figuring out what I want to do. I get a phone call from uh, George Tenet, who was running the CIA at the time. I knew George. George says, uh, I've got a problem for you. The agency has, and I wonder if you'd stop by and talk about it and see if you might be able to help. I said, well, of course. And uh, the most vital thing that the CIA has is information. Without information, they're nothing. They've always had a, played a leading role in acquiring information. He said the trouble is that the heart of the technology of acquiring information is no longer in the United States government. As I said before, it's in Silicon Valley, uh, Atlanta, Huntsville, so on. And he said that uh, we can't hire at government salaries people uh, who are also being offered jobs in Silicon Valley and given stock options and ownership. And we are losing our lead in uh, the ability to acquire information through technology. He said, we need to figure out something to solve this problem. And uh, I've had somebody here at the agency, a few people thinking about the problem and wondered if you'd think about it and maybe help us make it happen, whatever you come up with. And so I sat with the folks from the agency and uh, they had been thinking about it. And I thought about it some, and we decided what was needed was something that we called at the time Intuit. And Q was the guy in the movies that did the technology work for the spy in the movies. So we set out to form that. And the idea was to have something that was totally separate from the government. It would have its own board of directors. Uh, it would only serve the government as a customer. It would abide by all American laws that affect business in America. But you are independent of the government, except for one thing, and that is the government will send you money every year. That sounded like an interesting new idea that I had not seen before. And so we put together a board of directors of just really outstanding people. Any Fortune 100 company would love to have had. Bill Perry was one of them, interestingly enough. So we had this great group, and uh, we put together a, a company called Incuit, and uh, we hired a CEO who had built two gaming companies in uh, Silicon Valley, extremely successful, made a ton of money, wasn't interested in money, but wanted to work for us as our CEO. And we hired people a lot like that who just were interested in the subject, wanted to help. And uh, with a great group of people as workers as well as a good board. And so we went in business. And uh, I get a phone call that uh, we're liable to be sued from Intuit. We had gotten the name Intuit patented, copyrighted. We, we had done it by the books. They, so we were legal. Well, it turns out the guy who ran into it, which I frankly knew nothing about, was like me. We were both on the board of, Lock of Procter & Gamble. We were both friends. And we sure didn't want to start out a big war between Intuit and Intuit. And so I, we had a bunch of T-shirts printed that said Intuit on it. So I gave him one of the T-shirts as a settlement <laughs> that we would get a new name if he would quit threatening to sue us. This is the kind of nonsense that goes on while you're trying to do real business. <laughs> and so we then came up with a new name in, 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 in Qtel, uh, where in his information, Q is the guy, the, the technician on the, the 
TV and tele, telecommunications. And the company caught on. And the first year we were investigated by every three-letter word in Washington, uh, the FBI, the GAO, the IG, you go through it. Because the word had gotten out that we were all going to make a ton of money on this company. And then we would take it public and sell it. Well, it turns out not only was it that against the rules of the big company, none of us were the kind of people that would have done that. And uh, some of us, including myself, were working for no money. We were there to help. But anyway, that rumor got out. That was a nightmare. We were being accused of all kinds of terrible things. And then uh, there was an incident in the world that I can't even remember which one it was, where Incutel really proved valuable. And uh, that kind of put to bed the idea we were all there to sell the company and make money, which wasn't possible to begin with. Wouldn't have been legal. So Incutel prospered over the years, had a new CEO about 15 years ago, and it's going to have its 25th birthday celebration uh, this spring. So you have a defense aeronautical engineer, former CEO, and a guy who made video games decide to start a venture capital firm sponsored by the CIA. <laughs> I never thought of it that way, but it's, that's kind of ridiculous. Who would want people who would do something like that? <laughs> that's, that's, that's crazy. It is. I mean, you shouldn't do that sort of stuff. I mean, we should have been building rockets. <laughs> the trademark fight reminds me of yet another Augustine's law. One of my favorites, because I'm a former lawyer, recovering lawyer which is that bulls do not win bullfights, people do. People do not win people fights, lawyers no, do. It's 100% true. It is 100% true, sad to say. It, uh, and as a matter of fact, as I think about the laws, almost all of them are true today, and they all had data to prove them. Norm, we're going to give you your time back. You've had an amazing career. It was a privilege to just getting to hear you share some of your experiences and your journey. I know that there's, there's a whole generation of defense professionals out there that are going to really appreciate this interview and for you taking your time. So for speaking for all of them, thank you. I really do appreciate it. Well, Mike and Jake, it's, I've enjoyed thinking about some of these things. It's been a long time since I thought about them and uh, a lot of good luck along the way. And, uh, that's not modesty either. I mean, you, you could tell. I mean, I, I started out going north and wound up going south. And uh, it just had a lot of good fortune. I had great parents that raised me. They were not, not wealthy, but great parents. And uh, I just had a lot of breaks along the way. And this is the way it wound up. And Mike, just to be totally candid with you, I looked you up on the web here and there, too, to kind of see what your background <laughs> was. And you have a fine background and one of the things that appealed to me that you enjoyed humor and said <laughs> so we have that comment i just remember in 2024 uh you owe us a book eighth grade algebra then we'll uh then we'll, then we'll have to have you back on to the when your new book comes out it's a done deal Calibre. all right <laughs> <laughs>